It's called the Parnassus, and this is a detail of Apollo and the Muses. Apollo, god of the sun, of light, of music, and the fine arts, is said to have given Orpheus a lyre and taught him how to play it. Orpheus was sometimes said to be a priest of the Greek god Dionysus, who represents intoxication, transformation, and generation. And with his music, Orpheus could bring beings to a state of ecstatic divine consciousness. He seems to teach that the individual soul can be freed from its unconscious identification with the forces of nature when we break open the psyche, when the psyche breaks. Um, for Ficino, Orpheus was a real person who had been in line with this perennial wisdom. So the first was perhaps Hermes, and then, then later they said perhaps it was Zoroaster was the first. Hermes passed on to Pythagoras, to Plato, um, and to the Neoplatonic interpreters. And Orpheus was one of, these, one of the members of this group. For Ficino, Orpheus held the keys to love. Now we get to the point of the talk, love. Um, in Plato's Symposium, I believe you pronounce her name, Diotima speaks about love as being between the mortal and immortal, an intermediary between gods and men. Through this intermediary of love, priests attain their power, mysteries, incantations, divination, communion and conversation with gods take place through this intermediary of love. In Ficino's commentary on Plato's Symposium on Love, he addresses his loved one. There was a man he loved very much in a platonic sense. Um, his name was Giovanni Cavalcanti, who had inspired Ficino to write the book. Ficino apparently had been depressed, and Cavalcanti had encouraged him to write this book, which is a little difficult to find, a little expensive, but you can find it, and it's, and it's quite wonderful. He said, a long time ago, dear Giovanni, I learned from Orpheus that love existed and that it held the keys to the whole world. So to proceed orphically means to adopt a poetic vision, a vision rich in mythology, symbol, allegory, and metaphor. Love is higher than reason. You have to suspend your rational thinking and take, take a jump, abandon yourself to Eros. Ficino said, love is a magician because the whole power of magic consists in love. The work of magic is the attraction of one thing by another because of a certain affinity of nature. And for Ficino, the world was created from, lo for, from love and sustained by love. It's talked about in Orphic writings that when there was only chaos before anything came into existence, love was in the middle of it. The combinate. Okay, so now we will talk about love. Love was a popular topic in literary circles during the Renaissance. Uh, during the Renaissance, illicit love was commonly and openly practiced by all members of society. They were they were not prudes during the Renaissance. Um, there, there was a libertine approach to sexual matters in the Renaissance, which was carried all over from medieval customs. Various blatantly sexual medieval texts coexisted with Plato's philosophical concept of love. So there was this duality of this idea of spiritual love and sensual love. The poetry of the troubadours brought in a new ideal of courtly love, made, made love pure, refined, and beautiful. So after Ficino wrote his commentary on Plato's Symposium on Love, at the beginning of the 16th century, the Platonic conception of love led to many treatises about love. Beauty was led to uh, divine beauty. Love was divine beauty mirrored on earth. Michelangelo said, those who are blessed with wisdom can perceive that all the beauty of this earth is but a mirror of that celestial source whence all life springs. Piccino's commentary on Plato's Symposium on Love isn't really a commentary, and it isn't really an analogous to Plato's Symposium. It's simply a compilation of ideas about love. Plato's Symposium uh, concerns itself at one level with the genesis, purpose, and nature of love. Love is examined in a series of speeches by men attending a drinking party. Each has to give a speech about, about love. 
Plato was the first to suggest that the experience of falling in love, the madness that comes about when we fall in love, could actually be um, the, the passionate erotic longing for the beloved might actually be to the first stage of the soul seeking to free itself from the bonds of its earthly existence and begin its journey back to union with its divine source. In the symposium, the priestess Diotima talks about love as an initiation into the mysteries. Falling in love is the first stage. First, we have to be captivated by an individual, by the beauty of an individual, and then temper that intense attraction, intense feeling, so that we can begin to see that beauty in others as well, not just that one person. And from then, go on to seeing the beauty of the soul and the beauty of, of poetry, the beauty of art, the beauty of wisdom, the beauty of all kinds of beauty. But it had to start with the sensual world. And I think that was something that really came alive during the Renaissance because it's such a sensual, Italy is such a sensual place, right? And uh, <laughs> so of course it would have a sensual philosophy. <laughs> Ficino composed his commentary in 1469, immediately after completing his translation of Plato. I'm not going to go through all of this because it's a bit long, but this is from the introduction to, um, by Sears Jane from uh, Ficino's commentary. It says that, all right, I'll read it quickly. The cosmos consists of a hierarchy of being. It's the same as what we talked about with, the, with uh, Plotinus. Uh, from God to the physical world. In this hierarchy, every level evolves from the level above it in a descending emanation from God and desires to rise to the level above it in, a, in an ascending return to God. This desire to return to one's source is called love, and the quality in the source which attracts this desire is called beauty. The human soul, as part of the hierarchy of being, is involved in the same process of descent from God and return to God. In human beings, the desire to procreate, he calls it inferior beings, but simply earthly beings. It's called earthly love, and the desire to rise to human levels, to higher levels, excuse me, of being is called heavenly love. Human love is therefore a good thing, because in both of its phases, descending and ascending, it is part of a natural cosmic process in which all creatures share. So this was the, the liberating thing about the Renaissance. It was okay, it's great, you know, love. Fall in love, make love, here, there, everywhere. <laughs> okay. this, is, uh, this is a picture by Tiziano, uh, done in um, skipping some things here. Done in um, 1515. It's called Sacred and Profane Love. The Aphrodite or Venus that we see on the cover of the book and in Botticelli's painting is the celestial Venus. There was a celestial Venus and an earthly Venus. The celestial Venus was said to have been born from the castration of. Uh, Uranus by Saturn, when his genitals fell into the sea from the sea foam, uh, the celestial Venus was born. So she has no contact with matter, she doesn't have a mother. The other one was born from the marriage of Jupiter and Dione, and um, she is connected with, with the earthly realm. So they were two, they were twin Venuses. As well as two kinds of of, um, of love, earthly and divine, um, because Ficino and others wrote that earthly love was a step towards the divine, it also, uh, uh, women were also pleased by this, even though the symposium was written for and about men, it also liberated uh, women because they had a sense that, that they were important, that love was important, that relationships were important faithful relationships, the kind of romantic relationship.